Hello, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to today's event, Ask an Angel Investor with Dr. Bethan Kassman. Uh, my name is Letitia Taylor Smart, and I am the Director of Alumni Career and Personal Development with VCU Office of Alumni Relations. Before we turn it over to our wonderful expert in angel investing for today's conversation, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping points. Uh, we will be recording this afternoon's event, so don't worry if you blink a little too hard or missed a few seconds of the discussion, a recording will be available. Um, there's also live closed captioning available. Um, so you should see it on your screen. Um, but if not, go ahead and access that, locate the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And once um, you've clicked that, select show subtitles from the menu. Um, if you are having issues accessing this feature, message our VCU alumni chat bot for assistance. Also, I would like to thank those that were able to submit questions for our presenter while registering. So we're gonna to try to get to as many questions submitted as possible, um, but still feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A pane of the control panel that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, like I said, we would try our best to get to those questions if time allows towards the end of today's event. Um, and Bethany has also agreed that if we don't get to those questions that she will go through and answer some of your questions that you have today on the call. So, Without further ado, I would now like to introduce our presenter. Um, Dr. Beth Ann Kassman um, is a business angel investor and until recently, a professor of marketing and entrepreneurship in Switzerland and the UK. Following a successful executive career in the US, she has been employed as a consultant focusing on global expansion issues, strategy, competitive marketing, and acquisition strategies for companies located in Europe, Asia, and the US. Over the past 15 years, she has owned and invested in a number of companies, both in the States and in Switzerland. She is the co-founder of Go Beyond AG in Zurich, Switzerland, as well as the co-founder and CEO of Go Beyond Network in Naples, Florida, both angel investment companies. As a business angel, Kassman serves on a number of selection and investment committees in Europe and the U.S., she is the chairman of the board of Go Beyond Investing in Switzerland on the Portfolio Advisory Board and on the Next Wave Foundation Board, both in the U.S. She serves as a deal leader in four micro funds for portfolio, is a frequent speaker at Angel Capital Association, and recently was named as one of the top entrepreneurial women investors of 2018. She has a BS in psychology from Iowa State University, a master's degree from none other, VCU, and a DBA from Business School Lausanne, Switzerland. Bethann, thank you for being here. So let's go ahead and get started with the first question, shall we? So Bethann, explain to us, what exactly is angel investing? Okay, well, thank you for the introduction, Letitia. And hello to everyone out there. Um, so let me start by talking about what is angel investing? Well, angel investing really is when a private individual, sometimes companies, but most often private individuals, provide financial support to startup companies, to companies which are entrepreneurial in nature. And they provide the initial money to help the company get off the ground, usually in exchange for equity or for a partial um, ownership in the company. They're essentially sources of early stage funding across not only our country, across all countries, because it's very hard to get a company off the ground without some early stage funding. And they also provide, in addition to money, they provide contacts, mentoring, um, sponsorships, expertise, and other resources. And they also, one of the things which I'll mention later on is in America, many to be an angel investor as opposed to a crowdfunding investor, you have to qualify, you have to be accredited. And accreditation means that your net worth has to be more than a million and your actual annual income has to be over 200,000. Now I know that sounds rigorous and initially is <laughs> off-putting. However, it's, for, a, it's for, for your protection because angel investing is very risky. Um, you should never invest more money than is what you have for discretionary spending. And there's no guarantee you're going to make your money back, despite the fact that we hear daily about unicorns 
the reality is that one in 10 companies will make it. So <laughs> I think you need to keep that in mind. All right, thank you. So, so you talked a little bit about the crowdfunding piece of it, but so is angel funding like crowdfunding? Is angel funding anonymous? And also is angel funding a grant or must it be paid back? And again, I want to mention that these are questions from um, our registrants. So you all that are here ask these questions, so. Okay, well, the first question I've sort of addressed, crowdfunding is not angel funding. Crowdfunding allows anybody to invest. It, you, you don't have to meet the criteria that I mentioned a minute ago. In addition to which certain platforms on crowdfunding, such as Kickstarter, they're really pre-sale campaigns. If you've gone to some of those, you can get by investing in the company, they'll send you a present. They don't actually give you a piece of the company. Now, many of the crowdfunding companies do give you a piece of the company, but you have this whole range of what's available in crowdfunding. So you should be careful that you know what you're doing when you enter a crowdfunding platform. Um, angels, on the other hand, they bring, first of all, they bring more to the table than crowdfunders because they usually invest four times what a crowdfunder will invest. And they're all, but, but it's an augmentation to your own ability to raise money as an entrepreneur. And many times what you see is, you will see entrepreneurs applying for angel, applying to angel companies to get investment as well as crowdfunding. So they're not exclusive. Okay. Um, basically you could do both and uh, nobody would probably investigate or look at that askance. Angel funding can be anonymous. Now, how it's anonymous is that you can syndicate your funds. So what does that mean? First of all, you have to be in a group for it to happen, an angel group. But yeah. once you're in an angel group, you don't always have to invest directly. In other words, if, if you're investing in a company and the company wants as a minimum a 25, uh, as a minimum, you couldn't, you have to invest a minimum, they say, of let's say 50,000. Well, most mm -hmm. of us are going to want to invest 50,000. That's a lot of money. So maybe five of us each invest 10,000. Mm -hmm. That's called syndication. We pool our money. Under those circumstances, when you invest, your name does not go on what is called the cap table. A cap table, I don't want to get too technical here. A cap <laughs> table records the names of everybody who's invested in the company and the percentage of the company they own at that point in time. Oh. And in this particular instance, your name would not be on that table. The name would be on that, the name that would be on that table would be that the group of people you've investigated with. It's a legal entity and it has to be set up, which is why you usually do that through a company, either an angel group or a company that just specializes in um, syndicating investments. Is angel funding a grant or must it be paid back? Angel funding is, is not a grant. Um, <laughs> Angels, what angels are looking for is that your company will grow. So that if they put in a thousand dollars this year, three years from now, that money will be, that a thousand will have increased in value to 3000 mm -hmm. or 5,000. In which case, when you exit, because that's what we want you to do, angels want your company to either be sold or in the rare instance, go, go public. When it's sold, whatever the profit is on the shares that I've initially invested, or purchased from you, or the money that I've initially put in, will have doubled or tripled or whatever. So what we're looking for is not that it be paid back in terms of like a loan, we're looking for the company to grow and offer us profits as it exits when it's gotten bigger. Mm, okay. So this next question is a bit of a doozy, um, <laughs> but basically the sense of it is, you know, walk us step by step of the process of how to attract and obtain um, an angel investor. Where does one even find angel investors to begin with? You know, how do I find investors who are in alignment with my mission? So kind of with that second question, but how do I best, or how do angel investors prefer to be approached and what qualities should be considered when looking for an angel investor? Okay, definitely <laughs> a lot of questions in one. <laughs> let's, let's take each one at, a, at one at yes. a time. So how would you attract and obtain an angel investor? Well, the best way to do this is through your local angel group. 
Most cities have angel groups and you can apply to them to give a pitch. And there are usually a number of angel investors in that audience who might be interested in investing in your company. The other way you can do it is through networking. There are all kinds of groups within your cities or nationally. There's regional groups, there's companies like SCORE that might also determine without being in an angel group, people in SCORE, some of the advisors there may decide they'd like to invest in your company. I've done that individually, have invested in a company. And an angel investor is really anybody who gives you either advice or funds. So you probably know a few who would give you uh, certainly advice and some funds. So the best way to do this is to look through groups. And where does one find one? As I just said, you find them through uh, networking. The typical angel investor is over 40 and has some discretionary income. In other words, they have money that they could put into a risky proposition if they were intrigued with what you were doing. And they like to invest in an industry which is familiar to them. Mm. So in fact, if you're in a specific industry, such as healthcare, just as an example, you might talk to your doctor and see if he would like to invest or at least give you advice. Um, it turns out healthcare is one of the biggest areas in which people are investing these days. So I don't know how far that might get you, but you, that's one option. The point being, if you know somebody in an industry where your company is focused, you could approach those people at least for advice, which might lead to funding. And that's also how you would find investors who align with your mission. The other way is if, for instance, if you're interested only in impact investing, you can go online and find all the companies which are interested in investing in impact kinds of things. You can also go to the Angel Capital Association and you will find out the number of angel groups in your city or, or um, state. Oh, that's good. So, so that, would be, that could also be helpful. The other way you could find people who might align with your mission is go to the trade associations in which you are focused. Um, if you're in AI, for instance, there are, there are groups that do that. You can do that through universities. So you have to do a little homework. And I should warn you that um, looking for funding and angel investors could be a full-time job. Most CEOs, it's not their favorite job. Their job, they thought, was starting a company. Mm -hmm. And I can give you stories about how um, various CEOs and the companies in which I've invested have, the CEOs have decided they're tired of raising funds and they're going to sell their company. They had an opportunity to do that and everybody on their board may not have wanted them to sell their company. But in fact, if you, the board will take a vote and um, I've been in companies where the CEO has managed to sell his company which was turned out well, because otherwise he would have spent the next, the following two years also trying to raise funds. It's the CEOs who end up doing this. Mm. Angel investors um, prefer to be approached usually indirectly, mm. <laughs> either because you're asking for advice. I wouldn't go up to somebody you don't know and begin to ask them for money. The best way I think would be, and I've been approached this way to have somebody Somebody, people have called me and said, okay, I'm interested in this area. It might be an interest of, in which I invest in. And we'd like some information. We'd like, you know, you could ask them for information. You could ask them for advice. And only as you get to know them, can you really ask them for money. The other way is through these groups that I've mentioned, angel groups or regional networks. Uh, networking I cannot, I, I should not diminish anything about networking. It is the primary way in which you will get money. I can tell you that every day of the week, I get calls from people and usually I pay no attention to them. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be approached directly and most people don't. Um, if it comes to my network, I will feel an obligation to do something. So I will at least speak to you, the, you, the entrepreneur looking for an investment. And what qualities should be considered when looking for an angel investor? Well, I think you really need to keep in mind that not only is the angel investor sort of evaluating you and your company, you should be evaluating that angel investor. Are they somebody you're comfortable with? Do they share your values? 
Are they interested in patient money? In other words, are they going to put pressure on you to make a profit in the first year or two, or are they willing to wait? So you need to really look to see if the person you're, to whom you're speaking is somebody who you really feel you can have a relationship over time because angel investors can help you inordinately, but they also can, you can also run into problems with them if you end up not being in the same place with any investor. It's, it's, worth, it's worse with VCs because they have much more venture capitalists because they have many more objectives that they have to meet than an angel investor. So you should really look to see if you think you can work with this person because angel investors like to get involved. Great, that was helpful, especially the Angel Capital Association tidbit. Um, so that's a great way to look for groups uh, within the state. So again, if you all have questions, you know, based on, you know, Bethany's answers or anything you're hearing, please post them in the Q&A um, function of the Zoom. So our next question here, so when an entrepreneur entrepreneur has an idea and basic business plan, um, is cold calling um, known in investors a good strategy for finding investors? So you kind of talk to this, so. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm gonna be very blunt here and tell you <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't go, cold calling is not gonna work with an investor. It's better if you have an introduction to that investor. If you know somebody who knows somebody, that's the way to go. Cold calling will usually get you a polite response, but it won't get you down the road any further. So I suggest networking or introductions as the best way to go forward. Great. And then we did have a question along with the networking groups, things of nature. Um, someone asked, um, could you share what type of networking groups do you belong to, Bethann? Um, sure. If you're willing to uh, share. Okay. Well, some of them you gave in the introduction. I mean, I obviously belong to Go Beyond, which is a community of over 600 investors. I also am a member of Portfolio, which is a company on the West Coast, which has micro funds, which um, invest in 11 verticals, a vertical being a specific area. So there's some like consumer products, there's some like fem feminine, I hate this word, feminine technology called yeah. Femtech, agricultural uh, technology, enterprise. Um, they have, you know, a number of funds, aging. And if you have a, they're not all actively looking right now for, for companies because some of the funds have expended their mm -hmm. money. A fund has a limited amount of money to invest, mm -hmm. but there are, there are funds out there in portfolio. They're mainly interested in women in investing in women. So that's one option. Um, I also am a member of Next Wave Foundation, which is an impact company out of Colorado. I'm also a member of the ACA, which you've just heard about, and in Europe of EBAN. And um, there are regional groups in which I participate as well. So there are a number of different groups out there where I'm involved, and it's always a changing, it's a changing um, dynamic because there are many times when I find that I'm just not interested in what that particular group may be doing anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's helpful. That's great. All right. So for our next question, um, what do angel investors need to see from a business when making a decision to invest or not? Should I show an angel investor a business blueprint? Uh, um, <laughs> okay. First of all, what, what they want to see is not a prof, is not a typical business plan. Most often angel investors want to see either a page or a page and a half of what your company is about. You, I don't think most angels look at 15 to 20 page business plans, not initially. Initially, what you're going to probably the way you're going to first attract angels is through giving a pitch, which is a presentation. These pitches are limited. I know this is going to probably be surprising to some of you to seven to 10 minutes. Mm. So what you can say in seven to 10 minutes is going to determine whether they'll then want to see your business plan. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to one, say, what are you doing? 
Why is it disruptive? In other words, why is it something that's atypical so it might make money? What angels want to do is make money in the long run. So you need to show them something that shows that you know what it is your company is doing. You need to at least be knowledgeable about your industry and you need to be able to talk to them in a way that has them convinced you are knowledgeable and willing to work with them. So definitely don't show them a business blueprint. <laughs> at some point in time, you will show them a business plan. Okay. And we can have a discussion at some point in the future on what that is. But <laughs> um, So the key word is to be concise as possible. That's the key word. Yes. Nothing um, overly lengthy. Yes, correct. So the next question we have here, um, what stage of business development is necessary to even consider reaching out to angel investors? Um, and we already kind of went over what is required in return, but more so just think about that first part of the question. You know, what, what is the stage of business development when it comes to reaching out to angel investors or is there one? Well, I will tell you that there are angel companies for every stage you're in. Um, I work with one company in Colorado. They only invest in very early stages. Now, very early stages is not an idea. Mm -hmm. You've shown proof of concept by the fact that you either, you don't have to have revenue in those cases, but you certainly should have clients or at least people with whom, who have an interest in what you're doing. Um, so there are, company, there are some companies that just invest in early stage. There are other companies which just invest in later stage and there's everything in the middle. So you have to find out sort of which companies are where, which angel groups are, are where their interest lies. Now, one of the things I can share with you is that in recent years, things have changed. It mm -hmm. used to be that angels who had good ideas and not a lot of revenue could get investment. But what's happened is a lot of things have happened. Um, there's a lot of money out there if you know how to access it, but the returns, the exit is taking a much longer time. So mm -hmm. people like myself who are not interested in early stage and very early stage companies, I'm looking for companies that have income, that have revenue. And I want to, that's what I'm interested in. If I go to my portfolio groups that I work with, it depends on the vertical as to what we're interested in. In ag technology, early stage is good, mainly because there isn't a lot going on. It's, it's now emerging as an area. But, but feminine technology is much more advanced. So we are looking for companies which are much further down the road. So I think it, that's basically what you have to look at. You have to look at, there's money out there for all stages. You just have to find the one that fits the stage you're in. That's good, that's good. All righty. So we already kind of went through this, the angel investors invest in already established businesses or does someone willing to invest in ideas. So you kind of already said this, so I won't belabor on that question anymore, um, but how do you suggest one to best market their business to make it appealing um, to a potential investor? So you talked about it being, you know, atypical or disruptive. If there, are there any like specific things that, you know, you would want to speak to on that? Well, I think that it's very important that you understand the market and the, and the industry in which you are operating. It's not enough just to um, have revenue or and you have to fully understand what's happening in your own marketplace. So for instance, if I was an investor who was very interested in investing in health and you presented to me a telemedicine company, which is a big trend right now, mm -hmm. I would expect you to know everything there is to know about telemedicine. And you better show me that you know that. The other thing I expect you to know is the competition in your area. Mm. Most people say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of competition. And it's the least developed part of any business presentation I have seen. And it's really a negative if you, if you say there's no competition because even with a very new product or services, there's always competition because there are already uh, consumers or yeah, consumers are already spending money on something that's related to your business. Otherwise it wouldn't be a disruptive technology. Yeah. So you need to, you may not have to know all your competition but you better look down upstream and downstream and try to figure out 
where there might be some competition and make it clear because that is also an indication of how well you know your market. So I would say that the things that are really important is to understand the market and competition and to listen to what is really being asked by the person to whom you're speaking so that you can address that question in a very uh, knowledgeable way and concisely. <laughs> and concisely, great. Um, so we kind of already talked about this. So when evaluating an investment opportunity, what are the top three three things? So maybe you can give you know you, anything else, like what are the top three things you focus on in particular? Okay, well, there are some things I didn't mention. Okay, I agree. And it's not only me here. I think I should mention that if you are in an entrepreneurial class or if you've ever attended any meetings, everybody always says the team. Mm. It's very important that the team is something that you look at. And in fact, um, I'm gonna give you just a little example of what happens if the team is not in the right place. There was a company that I was a deal leader on. I love their product. Mm -hmm. It was um, a robot that would paint that this is a woman's product, but anyway, it was a robot. You stuck your finger into the robot's area and it would paint your fingernail and put a um, decal on. You chose the decal and it would be all done automatically. You put your fingers through the whole robot. I loved it. L'Oreal, which is a big <laughs> sold. <laughs> and, their pro and I liked it because it could be sold to me as an individual or to beauty shops or nail salons. And in addition to which L'Oreal was extremely interested in this product. So there was an institutional investor. Mm -hmm. We thought it was myself and the other woman who's doing the due diligence. We thought it was great until we met the CEO. The mm -hmm. CEO was somebody who was a know-it-all. She mm -hmm. didn't listen to one thing we said. She was rude. She was very aggressive. And in the end, she ruined it and we never invested in the company. Now it turned out that we were right because others backed off as well. Oh, so wow. you have to have a team that understands when you're presenting to people, one, be polite, but two, know enough that you're not, you're not the know-it-all. You may know more than the investor about your business as an opportunity, but you better be open to what you're really being asked because most of the time investors wanna be able to work with you in some way. So it's important that the team be considered. Now, the other thing I think I might mention here, we talked about the market potential and competition, but financials. Mm. If you're an early stage company, your financials are a bunch of, I hate to tell you this, but there are a bunch of assumptions and most experienced investors will not take those overly seriously, which is a good thing for you because you probably won't make what is in there in any case. So only if you're a more advanced company, our angels are going to look at those financials, really. But the one thing you want to be careful of is that even in a presentation that you're making, you don't show a hockey stick. A hockey stick, I don't know if you can see my hand here, but it looks like this. Mm -hmm. In other words, it starts off low and then it, it elevates itself very quickly. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that because that's a, a sign right away, especially if you're an early stage company, that you're not going to get 15% of the market. You're not probably going to get that big climb that I showed. So you need to be careful not to show hockey stick projections in the financials. So those are the things that when I evaluate a, a company, I look to make sure their financials are not totally crazy. Mm -hmm. Actually, I like conservative ones. I look to see that the team is somebody with whom I could work. And I also want to be sure that the market has a place for your company, that it's something different than what's out there right now. Um, that's great. I want to say like, just as a follow-up question that somebody posed too, is what if you are just looking for advice from an angel investor? Do they expect anything for their time and expertise for that advice? I can only answer for myself. <laughs> I give a lot of advice and I'm happy to do so. My advice may be worthless <laughs> as and definitely you shouldn't go to one person for advice. You, yeah. should, you should sort of mix it up because we're all individuals and we all have different ways of looking at things. Yeah. However, I definitely think that I, I would imagine, I mean, most angels I know are very happy to give advice, to give you yes, something to think about. 
That's helpful. All righty. So this is a very kind of specific question. So someone wanted to know if you've had an angel round in the past, um, is the second angel round feasible? And I might have shifted some of our questions that I gave you, Bethan, but. That's okay. Um, in fact, there is a word for second go rounds and that's there's called follow on investments mm. and most angels expect to do follow on investments if the company is growing and scaling okay. now why do most angels want expect to do that because in fact if you need more money and you go to a whole new group of people well first of all your shareholder agreement with the with the angel the the agreement you have the term sheet with the angel the angel group talks about something called preferential rights. So the angels who've already invested in round one have the rights to invest in round two. If they don't, then you can go, if they choose not to invest, you can go to others. It's called follow on funding. And the reason why I would invest if the company's doing well, is if I don't invest, the amount of shares I own decreases because as your base increases, if I don't invest more, I'm going to have less of a pot in your money. I'm going to have less money in your company. In addition to which, I'm also not going to be able to take advantage of your valuation as it increases. In other words, every round, if, I, if you have a second round of funding, your valuation, what you value the company at, which is there's a million different formulas to follow for finding that out, but the valuation should have increased. And okay. if it increases, I need to take advantage of that. So second rounds, third rounds, I invest in a company and everybody laughs at me. They were, because they're done by letters, series A, series B, series C, whatever. I invested in a series G. I've never invested in a company in a series G and they'll probably have to sell it for billions for me to make money, but <laughs> I went ahead and did it. So yes, there are lots of rounds that you could invest in. Great. Thank you. So what are your thoughts on the ease of getting capital for a new startup, uh, specifically here in the U.S.? Well, I think it's always been hard to get money for a new company in the, anywhere, whether it's the U.S. or anywhere else. Um, there are different ways to get money. First rounds are usually family and friends. So mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have an idea which has not proven any traction yet, you don't even know if it's really feasible, then you're best to go into your family, your own funds, some friends. Um, and sometimes that works out very well for those people who invest. More often than not, it doesn't go anywhere and they've just you know, given you some money. It won't be a lot probably. Um, once you've gotten past that, then we've already discussed that you have to find other angel investors to invest if you want to have angel investors. Investors will take part of your company. In other words, I buy shares in your company. And the way I make money is those shares are worth more as time goes on. So you're giving up part of the ownership of your company once you take on investors. Other ways to get money. If you're lucky, you might get a loan. It's a long shot, but you might be able to get a loan from a bank against, not against the company, but against other collateral. You might be able to get a grant now, sometimes grants are very good, particularly if you don't, if they don't take a piece of the company. If they take, if the grant requires, if it's, if you have a company which has a lot of intellectual rights, um, and and the place where you're getting the grant wants access to those in, um, intellectual rights, that may not be a great deal for you. But if they're willing to invest to help you get further up the road, usually they won't want to get anything in return frequently. I mean, you may have to compete for those grants. In other cases, they may want something in return and it may be worthwhile for you to do it. It depends on what area you're in. But it's not easy to get capital. And as I mentioned before, as the CEO, you should be prepared that for the first couple of years of your company's life, you will probably spend it trying to get capital. Mm. Good, okay. Uh, what do you, what questions do you wish entrepreneurs would ask angel investors more? What are some questions absolutely not to ask? Okay, well, um, the questions that I wish entrepreneurs would ask investors more is what are what do they anticipate? How okay? Let me start that over. I'm sorry. Um, 
I think the entrepreneur has every right to know how much they how much what does a typical investment look like? How long does it take to make an investment? Because usually there's an investment cycle where you present and then the company does what is called due diligence. They really look at what's going on. And then the company gets a vote, sees how many people want to invest. It could take 15 months. So you want to know if you're talking to a company, how long will the investment process take? How much do they typically invest? What is your top concerns about either your industry, either the industry in which this, your company is in or your particular company? What are their interests? And I guess the question that a lot of people don't ask, which they should ask, is would you be interested in being a lead investor? Mm. A lead investor is somebody who will actually put in most of the money for the round you're trying to raise and who will be available to support you in speeches and other talks. And honestly, a lot of companies won't invest, unless, a lot of angel groups will not invest unless you have a lead investor. Oh, wow, okay. So that lead investor becomes more and more important as you begin to look for, for more formal for kinds of money. Okay, what shouldn't you ask? Please don't ask me to sign an NDA. <laughs> <And I'm just laughs> wow. Because you can ask that question, but not for the first go round. You should ask that when you're further down the road because most entrepreneurs, most uh, angels or investors do not want to have to sign an NDA. They see many, many companies, some of which may be very similar to yours. So signing one would cut you out of the process if you were to ask for one. The second thing we've already talked about, you shouldn't ask, um, you shouldn't, ever state that you have no com competition. You shouldn't ever say you need a salary. Mm. You should never state that you don't know what your unique selling point is. All those things should be things you know, and you shouldn't, and if you're asked, I, I, I flipped this bottom question around just a bit, you should be prepared to answer those. Um, and I guess because when I, about the salary, I often give advice um, that it probably takes 12 to 18 months before you'll be in a position to collect a salary. So you should have money to support yourself during that period of time. Um, as a follow-up, someone asked, um, as a company matures, how should an entrepreneur go about buying out an angel? Is this frowned upon? No. Now, there are a lot of ways to do it. Actually, that's an interesting question because we are now, there's two ways to, to look at this. We, my company, are looking to help some, some investors exit. So we are asking if there are other angels within that, or within that investment cycle who would like to buy some of those sh shares. And we also the entrepreneur can um, want to buy back the shares, but he'd have to offer a fair market value. Yeah. And there's also ways that the entrepreneur wants to get, uh, I should say, if the angel wants to get rid of the shares, they can go to the secondary market. The secondary market is basically the market where you have the ability to sell your shares to others. Um, yeah. And often you have to be in a very good position to do that. I bought Twitter shares on the secondary market before they went public. No, it didn't make me rich, <laughs> which was my big dream. But, <laughs> but you can buy shares on the secondary market. Investors can do that. So you can try to sell your shares on the secondary market and entrepreneurs can try to get their shares back. Just offer a price and see what happens. Great, thank you. I hope that was helpful. Um, so this is a very specific question that uh, honestly, I didn't really know about it. So this person is, must really, um, you know, be well mature in their business. But how important is the elevator speech versus the pro formas? Well, the, they happen at different stages. The elevator speech is the most important thing if you're starting to raise money because it's your access to the investor. You can't even show them the pro forma until you've made your speech and they're willing to hear you and to see you. The performers become very important as you company as your company grows and as you're looking for second round funding and as you're thinking about what it is you want to do going forward. And then the performers should be as realistic as possible, particularly in the projections for the following years, years one, years after 
you've um, become live and started to do things. But the elevator speech is, speech is really important because if you, if you are not successful there, you will not have an investor. Got it. Great. Um, so we're trying to get through as many questions as possible, guys. Um, so how do you maintain controlling interest in your business when accepting venture capital or angel investment into your startup? Okay. Well, we've not talked about the term sheet. However, when you have an investor, you will have a term sheet. And the way you maintain control is to try to keep control of 50% of your company. In other words, you don't want to sell, you don't want to sell enough shares in your company that you are less than 50%. So that's one way. The other way you keep control is that you, you, you know, initially you don't need a board. However, you will need a board at some point in time. So what you do is you put together an advisory board and you make sure these people and these people could be friends and family or whatever, um, they may change over time, it's advisory. Those people should have your interests at heart. So in fact, that when you go to put a board together, you, you put on that board people who share your, your values and your vision. And therefore they will help you go forward. The major, the major way you keep control is that you uh, own enough of the shares that you carry the most votes. Great. And then a follow-up question um, that was asked, what should you do if an angel investor is asking to be paid to help the company succeed? You How say do you approach God. that? <laughs> you, you say, say what? goodbye. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there you go. No, you don't. You don't. You don't take on people who think they can. That's I know of companies that done that. It usually doesn't work out for anybody. Uh, my my feeling on that is fairly strong. Um, you say goodbye now. Later on, and I know this because I have some companies that have done this. Later on, you may decide that you want somebody from your investor pool to actually either work for your company in a capacity like. We had one guy who went in and he actually went in as CEO. Oh, wow. And he helped the company be sold because he, you know, the person who starts the company isn't always the person who makes the exit years later. Mm -hmm. um, people are good at starting companies and others are good at growing companies. So in fact, you have to see how that's going to work for you. But um, by and large, if somebody comes in and they want to be paid, the answer would be no, particularly if they only want to give advice. If they want to be the CFO, the chief financial officer, you might consider it if that's what their background is, but then they would take the position of somebody in your company. And another way that some companies that I know have paid people is that they've given them shares of the okay. company. So when you start out, you can't afford a part-time finance person or a part-time lawyer. You could offer them shares in your company. But remember that your shares are limited. You have a limited number of shares in your company and you want to keep them because usually you give some to the top officers in your company, like the CEO. Mm -hmm. You may want to keep them to give some to the board members because you're not going to probably have money to pay board members initially. So there are things that you need to think about when you're, when you're looking at your pile of shares because um, you need to keep them so you are in control. Great. Thank you. All righty. So are there any particular online platforms um, you would encourage those seeking funding to utilize? I know we mentioned some of those um, groups and things of nature, but I don't know if there are any online platforms. Well, most angel groups don't have their own platform. Okay. I shouldn't say that. If you want to submit your, um, your application, the angel group you're looking at will have a way for you to submit it through their website. We have a way to submit to our company through our website. There are some generic platforms. One is called GUST, G-U-S-T, which in the very beginning was very helpful. But right now, um, I still get probably three or four a day on GUST. But by and large, I think I've only invested in three companies over four years that have come in through GUST. Mm. So there aren't any online pl platforms I would encourage. If you are looking for crowdfunding, then I would go to AngelList or okay. I'd go to 
Cedars, I'd go to those kinds of companies. But in terms of particular online platforms, um, I think that the, your best bet is to, to look at the angel groups you're applying to, and they usually have a platform where you can submit an application. Perfect. What would you say is the most common hangup in negotiations for investment? I think the, there are two things. One has to do with making sure you, the entrepreneur, fully understand the term sheet. What are the terms in the term sheet? Make sure you know what a warrant is. Make sure you know, you know what, what a drag-along clause is. Make sure you know what these things mean because once it's signed, it's a legal document. Mm. And the other, um, so that's, for me, that has been, one, the most shocking thing about how little is known, but also I think the other thing that people should know is what, what about, what are you going to do with um, people who want to be on the board, who want to be a lead investor? Oftentimes, the invest before you even get to a term sheet, the negotiations break down because, you, as I mentioned before, you don't have a lead investor. And that's the piece which is the hardest to find. Um, so I would say that the most common things are not having a lead investor and not fully appreciating what all the term what all the terms mean in the term sheet. Okay. What is an acceptable profit for an angel investor? Okay. Um, well, one of the things, first of all, is how much of the company you've given to the angels. I mean, have you given, if, you, if you've given up to 50%, then, and the company has grown, that would be very appealing. In today's world, angels expect to get their money back in five to seven years. It used to be three to five. It's now five to seven years with a return out of investment, which is pretty high of 20 to 40%. So the bigger, the better. Mm -hmm. We want companies to, who we think will return 2x, two times our investment to five times our investment. Now, obviously, we want to get 10x back, but we've, I, in all the years I've invested, I've only had one company that gave us 10x back. Oh. I've had two, seven x but mostly what they want is they want to see a lot of growth. And so I can't give you a, in a profit in anything other than multiples of what they've invested in. Anything below 2x is not of interest, but of course, when I invest in a company, I don't know whether it's going to succeed. So it could be a failure and I get zero back. Mm -hmm. If I get 1x back, at least I've covered my investment. But I want things that are between 2 and 5x, the majority of my investments, and a couple that are 7 to 10x. Okay, good to know. So we're shifting gears more so of, you know, of angel investing of more so how does someone become an angel investor? Okay, well, first of all, in America, you have to meet the requirements that I stated, which are put out by the Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC, and they want accredited investors. And I've, I've already mentioned that you have to have a net worth of at least a million and, and make 200,000 as an individual, 300,000 as a couple. However, you can become an angel with a lot less money through crowdfunding which we did mention. Right. Now crowdfunding, there are lots of problems with crowdfunding and there are lots, some positives. Crowdfunding doesn't do the kind of due diligence that an angel group would do. In other words, they don't study the company enough. And so you don't know what you're really getting into there sometimes. Um, the other way I talked about was syndication where as little as $5,000, you could pool your money with other people making an investments if the angel group to which you belong is willing to have you do that. Um, not all angel groups allow for syndication. There, you know, there are companies that just do syndication uh, and you don't have to be part of an angel group. You just have to get a bunch of people together and then see if between you, you could put together a group and then you could go to look for a syndicator. One of the ones that I know about is Loon Creek. Loon Creek, all, all they do is syndication. And then you could also join an angel fund like Portfolio or... Um, or uh, the, they're a little different, but micro funds where you would invest 10,000 and you would have a portfolio of seven to eight companies by the time that fund had expended all their money. 
it's usually a good idea to invest in more than one company because as I said, the statistics show that one in 10 companies doesn't make it. Yeah. So it would be to your advantage to spread the risk a bit and have five or six or seven, but that means you're investing more money. So it depends on what your discretionary income could be. But you can become an, an angel investor without being accredited just by offering to help your next door neighbor give him $5,000 to do something. But be sure you get a little note from him telling what, telling him, telling you how you'll be paid back. Yeah, for sure. Right. Angel investing is, angel investing, I need to emphasize this, is very, very risky. Yeah. So just be aware. And more so specifically on your journey, was there something specific that inspired you to become an angel investor? Because, um, you know, for those that might not have read the bio or heard the bio, um, mm -hmm. but then actually also got her master's in social work from VCU. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about like, how did you become an angel investor and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Well, first of all, yes, I did get my master's degree in social work, but it was not social work as a counselor. It was social work administration. Okay. And, I worked, and while I was there, I worked on grants. So I got familiar with that part of it. However, uh, to answer the question, I, I, when I got out of school, I had a job and it was working at Dana-Farber Cancer Center in Boston. And my boss had just won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and he proceeded to start a company. My job was helping him develop companies. So I got very involved in developing his company. Unfortunately, I had no money and could not invest, which is too bad because the company is listed on the stock exchange today. Oh, wow. But I got totally carried away with loving to do that. And then I met a bunch of women and we decided to even though I was working again at another hospital, uh, buying and selling companies for this hospital in New Jersey, um, I met somebody who wanted to start a company where they analyze data for, for doctors. And I got involved in that. The company still, well, it's changed its name. It was New Solutions Inc. It's now about 30 years old. And that was my first company that I started. And then when we moved, I lived in Switzerland for 20 years. When we moved to Switzerland, I got involved in starting a company that um, imported dancewear for aerobic programs. So I, I came into it because I was intrigued by helping companies grow. And then of course, when you help a company grow, they need money. So that's how I got involved. I can tell you that in the beginning, I made very poor investments, not my own companies. Those were great. The company that I just told you about in Switzerland, that company is still alive. Mm -hmm. But I also invested in a couple of companies, a lot of money, which are not alive. And that's okay. why I joined an angel group and eventually started an angel group. I didn't want to do it on my own. You can yeah. do it on your own. But I think that really the first group I belonged to was a group that we just got, we met physically every month and we got very close to with it, one another. And I became totally intrigued by the, my ability to become knowledgeable about trends which were coming down the line in all areas. So I think what continues to intrigue me at this point in my life is that I get to see new ideas, new companies, new trends. And I think it's very exciting. I love it. And I hope to continue to do it for a while. Nice. Yes. And I do have um, one question that came in that was industry specific. So I wanted to hold off until I knew that we had the time. And I know we have a hard stop at one. Um, but somebody asked a specific question on what are your thoughts on is it possible um, to get an angel investor to fund a movie? Um, they said that they can see how a pitch could easily transfer there. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think my company, um, most of the companies I deal with don't invest in media or film. However, there are groups that do that specifically. I am not familiar with them, mm -hmm. but I, I know they exist. Um, there are certain areas that we would choose not to invest in, and one of them is film and media. Um, and we don't invest in real estate, but okay. loads of people are now investing in real estate. So if that's an area of interest, there are lots of companies out there that are investing right now in real estate. But films, it's really tough. Sorry. No, no worries at all. And again, we weren't able to get to all the questions that were even submitted. So like I said, maybe we can put together a document um, so that Bethany can do that. Um, but 
I thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. Oh, there's a one question. Do you invest in fashion? What are your thoughts about investing in fashion? Um, is that the same along the same lines of entertainment and media or? It depends on the kind of fashion. If it's okay. something unusual, like we had some wearable fashion, um, not technical wearable fashion that had, you know, devices attached to it that we looked at. I think it'd be great to have a fund. I'm trying to get our, one of our companies to do a fund on fashion, but so far I haven't succeeded. I think there's a chance. Um, we have invested in companies that use plastic, converted plastic to make um, materials and actually sold sweatshirts. Oh. Um, there's people who grow organic cotton and they've gotten funding, but I think it has to be something unusual okay. if you're going to go that route. Yeah, perfect. Um, so like I said, I thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. I hope that everyone that was on today's Zoom um, actually appreciated all of the advice um, and just expertise and knowledge that Beth Ann gave. Um, so I am very grateful. Lastly, everyone should now see a link um, to a short survey to complete so that we can get feedback and thoughts on today's event and how we can best shape our upcoming events. Um, if you aren't able to grab the link before we end today, uh, we we will also be sending it out via email within 48 hours along with the recording. Um, so again, thank you so much, Bethann. This was great. This was wonderful. Um, and again, if you didn't see in the chat too, there's a blog post um, where um, we did an interview with Bethann. Um, so she also gave some great tidbits there and talked about her journey. So please go ahead and look at that as well. On behalf of VCU Office of Alumni Relations, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you again, Beth Ann. And thank you, Letitia, and thank you all for listening in. Yes, thank you so much. Take care.